Hey everybody, welcome to Neil Talks. My name's Neil and it's time to talk QI. Uh, a number of months ago, I reacted to an episode called Quests Part 1. And as soon as I did, a bunch of people started saying, you know what, you've got to check out Quests Part 2 as well. Take all of your recommendations at your word. So I'm excited to jump into this one, but I'm curious as to whether it's very much in the same vein, whether it's got the same cast, I seriously doubt that it does, but who knows, there's novelties occasionally. And yeah, other than that, I know nothing about this episode. Is it going to be in the, that same sort of medieval quest vein that we had in the first one, or are we going off in a completely different direction? No clue. I don't know who the guests are. I have zero clue what to expect. Let's just jump right into it. This is episode seven from series Q, Quests, part two. Oh, we're going Star Trek. We come in peace from a distant galaxy, Susan Kalman. <laughs> we got teleporters. From another dimension, it's Joe Lysett. Beam him up. From a parallel universe, Holly Walsh. Oh, and some red shirt. Planet he's from Alien Davis. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh. oh God, this is the sexiest night I've ever had. <laughs> Joe goes. I don't know if I know that one. Our mission, should we choose to accept it, is to boldly go to a galaxy far, far away and become the first Earthlings to reach another star. Okay. So, my question is, shall we get going? Yeah. I, yeah. Yes. <laughs> no? It is not necessarily true that the earlier you set off, the earlier you will get there. Huh? Uh, because the technology yeah. can Is it Southern Rail? Accelerate. <laughs> <laughs> the technology on Earth will advance while you have gone off, and you'll be overtaken by rivals who've left later but in a faster spaceship. Oh. <laughs> that totally makes sense. Voyager 2, past Voyager 1. It's like splitting tickets to get from Glasgow to London. If you think I'll go on the half seven, but actually you're better to go on the eight sometime. And leave it a bit later. You don't have to change at Preston. That's it, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to change at Preston. It's just like changing at Preston. <laughs> <laughs> so our recommendation is yes. don't set off on an interstellar mission if it's going to take more than 50 years to get there. So that means the Nauvoo in the Expanse is premature because it's going to take 100 years. Basically, you want to put a three-year-old... In, an, in a rocket, don't you? You don't want to put a 50-year-old in a rocket. Even no, no, because you would go into um, stasis. You would do it like in, in Alien, they've got the tubes. <laughs> I don't know why they never wore pajamas, but... I guess hat. because if you think about it, fashion changes, you don't want to wake up. <laughs> what, timeless tartan pajamas? Yes. So... You look like no. Rupert the Bear. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would you send your ashes up into space? No. Oh, totally. Be marvelous. Yeah, Either that or an air burial. I mean, I don't know what you expect to happen when you are ashes. Fed to the birds. But I expect you can see and hear almost nothing. There's <laughs> 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 a company in America that now offers to turn your ashes into glassware. Yours would just be a shot glass. Wow. <laughs> Scathing, Holly, scathing. Rather than sending your ashes into space, they should just propel your dead body so that anyone <laughs> suddenly is you're like, is that Sandy talk to me? Like the past. <laughs> Basically, to get to the nearest star, it's going to take 72,000 years. So in space terms, despite the fact that they are all that distance from the Earth, 4 billion miles, it's effectively like we've just pulled the car out of the garage. Why is intercellular travel unlikely in the 21st century? What's the reason? Well, is it because everyone would die before you'd get anywhere? Yes, and also our best idea for rockets, which uh, use nuclear fusion, would cause radiation enough to kill any human being. The mutations mm. might be quite interesting, though. What mutations? Well, if you take Spider-Man as an example. <laughs> <laughs> 
of, yes. a, of a real thing that happened and yes. touched up by the government. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love how much of a nerd Susan is. I was once bitten on the left breast by a guinea pig. <laughs> it wasn't an irradiated guinea pig, I'll grant you. <laughs> Whether or not I would acquire the powers of a guinea pig. What's, what is the particular <laughs> guinea pig skill? Well, they eat you... their own feces, is all I know. <laughs> <laughs> because we'd be going so fast to Proxima Centauri, by the time we got there, there would not be the breaks in the world or in the universe that would slow us down. But in the Martian, didn't he, didn't he stop himself with a fire extinguisher? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Let's say we arrive on a, a little new different. planet a little different. find an alien. I thought what the physics in the Martian we would... Kill it. Fantastic, but realistic. The truth is that NASA does not have an official plan. Oh. But the truth is NASA doesn't have a great track record in terms of uncovering alien life. The Viking lander picked up soil from the dried lake bed of Mars and it roasted all the samples as part of the analysis process and it concluded there was no evidence of life. Yeah, you Curiosity, roasted it. So that's 40 years later in 2006, did the same experiment without incinerating everything and it did find organic compounds, so... It's another reason not to do that. Because we don't know its capabilities. If, you, if, you, if we've learned anything from the history of documentaries about aliens, <laughs> the common cold kills them. Yes. Well. But also, if you know anything about any creature that like you might find in a house, like, say, an ant, they're never alone. <laughs> they find a mouse. They don't live on their own, mice. Don't say that. We had one mouse in our house that didn't... Oh, come on. Oh, no, oh, don't no. say that. No, but... a family, little family. No, no. <laughs> Generations. Andy, what did you do with the mouse? Um, I... I a it. trail of cheese. <laughs> a trail of cheese out the back door. And it went, I think. <laughs> friends and said, look, you've got to come to this cheese emporium. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who believes that aliens have already visited Earth? Wow, straight up. Okay. Anybody else believe it? I think people who've been probed are correct. Oh, well, if that's it, yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> saw NASA in, in Glasgow checking for aliens. Right. So what if the aliens have just gone where they are not? It's just that they weren't there when the aliens were there because they couldn't be bothered to come to Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know what? moving on. I haven't even been to Glasgow and I bet there's some aliens NASA there. was worried it might sink. What did they think the moon was made of? <gasps> <laughs> oh, cheesy peeps. Just see it. What? <laughs> Cheesy peeps. Do you remember the, the Christopher for Biggin sh show on Safari? Yes. And there was... <laughs> such, <laughs> such a niche reference. <laughs> <laughs> there was quicksand. Yes. <laughs> Did they think... Shut up, <laughs> Absolutely oh. right. Well done. Yeah. They were afraid it was just like meters of loose dust, didn't they? But they did think it would swallow the lunar module whole, and that is why they had those great, flat, broad feet on the lunar module. In the 1960s, one in every 35 films featured quicksand. Oh, yeah. Who was quicksand's agent? Because he <laughs> was totally yeah. was doing well. Do you think it will kill you? Is it actually it a can. thing? Like, is it just... Yes, isn't it? It can be really dangerous. It's not going to kill you, is the thing. Yeah, but it, it does kill you. No. So... No. <laughs> <laughs> So you're going to love this, Alan, and we wanted to show how this works. We're going to kill Alan! <laughs> <laughs> Quests became quicksand. So here we are at the beach. <laughs> and you can see the groundwater swelling up. And what happens is liquefaction. Basically what happens is you ah. get stuck in the quicksand. Oh, That's not what kills you. What kills you is that the tide has come in, you haven't been able to get away. It becomes so thick that it develops into non Newtonian. Oh, liquid. okay. That means so it's like cornstarch and water. Change as you apply force to it. But frankly, most quicksand is only a few feet deep. So you and I might go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the panel will be absolutely fine. There are whole forums devoted to this. Um, the, it's yeah. like the TripAdvisor of sinkholes, and they rate them for the quality, the depth, the thickness, the available parking. Here is the worrying bit: um, <laughs> privacy. <laughs> Do you know what? I, I sort of get it, because I got for Christmas some of those jelly crystals that you put in, it makes the bath turn to a sort of jelly, and I felt pretty saucy when I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Did that not feel weird, like your subcutaneous fat was kind of dripping out of you? And you were... <laughs> 
I, I didn't think that yeah, at all. I, know what you <laughs> <laughs> I cannot have a bath. Because if I try and lie down in the bath, I just I go like that and I try. And it's not oh, I'll lend you um, our baby seat. It's really good. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> Octopus, mm. one of the things it can mm. do is make all the sand particles drift apart. So look at it, it's taking in water and putting it down to the sand and then it just disappears. Octopus is raw. Uh, so that's your quicksand. It's sandy, but it won't suck you under. <laughs> <laughs> Very on brand. But what should you watch out for when house hunting on the moon? Want to find a house. Just one house. Well, the difficulty. <laughs> What? Because it's different, the gravity and all that, that's different and all that there, isn't it? Because that's why the astronauts were all bouncing. It was because things are different. Yeah, gravity's one-sixth. She said scientifically. Yeah. <laughs> but I am wearing the blue of the science officers of Star Trek. <laughs> there are nerds in the audience who are waiting for someone to acknowledge that. Yeah. The red, of course, die first. Die first. Yeah, and some red shirts. But it's also command. So I don't exist. Yeah, you're the entertainment branch. <laughs> <laughs> there are moon quakes. So the moon does not have tectonic plates such as we do on Earth. Quakes are caused by the strain of changes in temperature. And all the time, honestly, the moon is ringing like a bell. It happens about every month or so. Really? And some of the footprints left on the moon by the Apollo astronauts may no longer be there. We definitely know that Neil Armstrong's yeah. very first footprint is not there anymore. Do we know why it's not there anymore? Because they never went, did they? <laughs> <laughs> Kubrick shot it on the soundstage. <laughs> Buzz Aldrin stepped in it. <gasps> I always hated this Frickin guy. Buzz. There's no caves or anything, are there? It's really interesting that you mentioned that because the Japanese space probe Selene recently found a huge cave oh, on the moon. Yes. Oh. I thought caves were kind of made by water. It's a 31 miles long and 100 meters wide. Yeah. Is it just one way in, one way out? Uh, I, t I don't think anybody's actually been in to find out if there's might an be a bear in there. Door. <laughs> <laughs> or a sandworm. What can't I hear you do in space? Scream. Scream's going to be a klaxon. So when you see films, pew, 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 wrong. Because you wouldn't hear the poop, 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 poop when I get excited about something. I pretend I've got like a, like a, a missile launch and I go, kachoo, 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 kachoo. She's <laughs> such a nerd. Car, I love if it. you're in a traffic jam, just, <laughs> just give it an answer. <laughs> Screaming sound? Yeah. Sandy was just pushing her to scream. Sound can't reverberate. But there are conditions where you could hear a scream, and that is what I'm going to come to. Uh, yes, I know, she got the, you there. No, she has <laughs> not got me there. Because the question I was presented by my learned friend yes. was, what can you hear in space? Answer scream. And I said, because space is completely silent. Oh, what God, I wish I was in space. <laughs> did not say what you might be wearing. Oh, well, for the love of God, Sandy. If you're in a vac suit and you have radio communication, sure. caused by the sure. vibration of molecules, and if you didn't have a space suit on, it would be... Or you could do the expanse forehead to forehead However, talk. astronauts can talk to each other by touching helmets. Uh, so... Yeah. <laughs> it's a bullshit answer, elves. Susan's completely right. You both got helmets, pop them on. <laughs> <laughs> They're enormous, much bigger than mine. Brian. <laughs> <laughs> now, now talk to each other. Hello. I've always loved you. <laughs> <laughs> I just like. <laughs> Not really, Sandy, I'll be honest. <laughs> We can't hear you! <laughs> I don't think I could really hear, but I don't really understand her at the best of times, so... No, that's just... <laughs> uh, what would an astronaut do with a Snoopy cap? So, that's the cap. That's Neil Armstrong wearing yeah. it. And it is the uh, communication sort of radio microphone combo. Like it Snoopy. looks like when I put a bra on my head for fun on a Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> that. <laughs> that's exactly what I did! If you want to be more like Neil Armstrong, check out my Patreon. It's one of my tiers, and it's a great way for you to get access, early access to all my reactions, plus four likes. You have not lived, I have that to look forward to. What would you do if you saw this chappy 
on the side of the road. Hitch bot. So is it? Is it the hitcher? It is. Yes. Yes. Pick it, it up. Oh, I... pick it up. You better pick it up. That is entirely correct. See how? Is this like the kindness of? Strangers so, kind of thing. Bot, it was a pair of robots. They were created in 2014 by David Harris Smith of McMaster University and Frank Zeller McMaster, of McMaster, Hamilton, University. Ontario. The aim was to see how far human kindness would take a mechanical oh. hitchhiker. Oh. In less than a month, one hitchbot hitched a total of 19 rides, travelling more than 10,000 kilometres. And then they thought, we'll travel across the United States. Oh no. <laughs> Philadelphia. 17 days after they set off, the robot was found beaten up and dismembered oh. in a drink. <laughs> Does it have a message on it or something? Frickin' Philly. I've had real emotional uh, problem with um, robots. Why? I fear the sentient nature of robots. You're afraid of robots? I love them, but I worry that they have feelings and we're ignoring them. What are you doing? I've just said I've got a <laughs> Three more seconds and it'll be towering over you. <laughs> <laughs> they asked 89 students to uh, look after a really cute looking robot called Now. And later on, they were told to turn the robot off. And it was programmed to say, No, please do not switch me off. <laughs> okay, listen to you. So. <laughs> please do not turn me off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> students who refused to turn it off at all. Do you remember Marvin from Hitchhiker's Guide? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Brain so, the size of a planet. Okay. <gasps> Marvin the paranoid oh, and... Oh, no. Great puppeteering. I think you ought to know I'm feeling very depressed. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, so you're a hitchhiking uh, robot. Uh, any idea why someone might want to murder you? I'm 50,000 times more intelligent than you and even I don't know the answer. It gives me a headache just trying to think down to your level. Mm. Wow, I'm getting an inkling about that murder thing. Uh, <laughs> I know perfectly well I'm only a menial robot. Well, anyway, 42 points to Marvin. Let's give him a round of applause. 42 points. <laughs> it was one of the camera things that went to a planet or the moon or somewhere like that. And the last message it sent was, it's going very dark now. And I was just like, oh my, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. The Opportunity Rover on Mars. Yeah, which, and it yeah. sent a wee message saying, that's me yeah. away now, it's going dark. And I was like, oh my I, God. I don't think it said, that's me away now. It's <laughs> 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 me away now. <laughs> it was a rover. Before Marvin was actually designed by somebody. Uh, it was designed by Dirk Maggs, producer of the last four series of Hitchhiker, uh, operated by his son Tom. And Dirk has just flown in from New York, especially where the sixth series... Is Dirk's the producer of, of the Sandman I'm audio yeah. book, too. Really cool productions. Check them out. What are these people firing at each other? Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> Not lasers. Light emitting diodes. A torch. Infrared. So you don't actually fire lasers, why not? Because you'd because die? You would die, yes. <laughs> Which would be so fun. Yeah. The thing about uh, laser beams is you can't see them side on at all, right? Did you say lesbians or lasers? <laughs> <laughs> lesbians, super skinny, only two dimension. And see how many lesbians you can see on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> I was here all the time. <laughs> Why might I say that Laser Quest is full of losers? Is it going to be an acronym? Or it is. It is an acronym. You're absolutely right. Do you know what the acronym uh, Laser? Do you know what it stands for? Oh, no, light no, amplification. The, past, the first one's light. Yeah, mm. Light amplification by stimulation Stimulated. of radiation. Yeah, radiation. Is the radiation. Thing. Some people have noted that the light is technically being oscillated, so a more accurate name would be light oscillation by right. stimulated emission. Loser. Strictly speaking, a laser Losers. ought to be yeah. a, a loser. loser. Loser quest. Ah. What is this? Yes, true. A melon. <laughs> <laughs> Lateral thinking. Or is it the Earth? Is it Mars? It is an artist's impression of what is a moon moon. Okay, so this is a wonderful piece of science. <laughs> How many moons does Earth have? Can a moon have a moon? Mm. So it's a really interesting question. This going around the moon and the whole mm. thing going all the way around the Earth. Yeah, like understand the concept. It, it is mathematically. Yeah, I'm going to say yes. Yes, it is mathematically if it's possible. It's got enough gravitational hoop. Okay, so the baby moon, the ping pong ball, if you like. I know the word for the moon moon. I know. <laughs> Moonette. 
I think it's technically called a tax haven. <laughs> <laughs> would have to be no more than six miles in diameter. Any bigger than that, it would get pulled towards the planet. Earth has actually got two extra moon-like dust clouds that orbit the planet. Each one covers an area of space nine times wider than the Earth. <laughs> Name this phenomenon. Northern Lights? Is it no. I didn't get a good look at the picture. Is it a shooting star? It's not a shooting star. Can I just say, I've yes. watched this show loads, okay. and I've always hated Comet? that font. <laughs> <laughs> awesome on the response time. I love it. Awesome. It is not the Northern Lights. No, it's definitely the not the Northern Lights. And the name is just an ordinary name. It's Norman. <laughs> Steve. Yes! No. It is <laughs> what? 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 It's called Steve! No, it's yes! Not. It can't be. The Citizens Science Sky Watching Group, and they named it after the 2006 children's film called Over the Hedge. Yeah. You know this film? Yeah. Well, the animal characters, not knowing what a hedge is and wanting it to be less frightened, named it Steve. <laughs> so when they discovered this and they didn't know what it was, they decided to name it Steve. <laughs> Stretch for thousands of miles in a beautiful it? purple uh, band. Forget going out into space and looking back at the Earth. I just had a very spiritual experience there. <laughs> <laughs> How many points do I get for that? It's looking good. It's looking very good. Oh, <laughs> just because he said Steve. Yeah. <laughs> you said Norman, which isn't even an interesting period for churches. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Steve. <laughs> Nobody's quite sure what it is. Now, Still, what's so dangerous okay. about flying through an asteroid field? In with an asteroid? They're not dense at all. <laughs> it's no more dangerous than flying through normal space, so we have to blame science fiction here. What? The truth is, the average distance between asteroids is about 600,000 miles. When you do come across one, about the size of a tennis ball. I don't think that's right. Susan's been in the asteroid belt, she knows better. Um, no. <laughs> okay. Were you there when the asteroids were made? Hold on. Twelve spacecraft have so far travelled through our solar system's asteroid belt. None of them has ever come even close to But that's your issue right there, Sandy Foxbeck. Our solar system. I'm talking about the other solar systems that exist. <laughs> All the other ones All that we the don't other know one. about. Weirdly, we're sticking to facts we knew. <laughs> QI brackets Earth version. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. The chance of being hit by an asteroid is about one in a billion. Yeah. The chances of anything coming from Mars are a million to one. They say, woo, wee, wee. <laughs> then they cut to the shot of the two of us with bras on our head. <laughs> <laughs> When I was younger, we only had one tape in the car for summer holidays, and it was that one tape, and we listened to it for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had the same with Joseph's Technicolor dream coat. Oh, yeah. A flash of light, my golden coat flew out of sight. Colors <laughs> will <laughs> I was left alone. Was left alone. <laughs> <to> the <beginning. laughs> The audience knows. Oh, well we are still dreaming. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> the asteroid belt contains a lot less material than you might think. <laughs> Why is this skirt called? Oh, <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> All of you. <laughs> <laughs> Why is this skirt called a mini skirt? Uh, <laughs> because of the size of it. It was named after the Mini Cooper, named after the car. Um, so it had nothing to do with the size. So Mary Quant, who she's the person who sort of uh, popularised. Oh, it's named after something she that's named for being many of the small. Of the Mini Cooper. She never ever mentioned that it was small. But it was small. 
I really liked the wig she was wearing. So I've got it for you because I thought you would look really nice in it. Oh, just checking you haven't got the rest of the outfit. No, I have not. <laughs> <laughs> Steve! Oh, you <laughs> It, it matches his, it, it complements like his, alien, his <laughs> tunic. Captain Kirk, I will destroy your ship, you naughty boy. <laughs> <laughs> In fifth place, light years behind the rest with minus 56, it's Alan. <laughs> uh, with minus three in fourth place, it's Susan. <laughs> In third, it's Joe. Yeah. Okay, I'm assuming uh, Marvin wins because he's up 40. In space, it's Holly. And our winner tonight with 42, it's Marvin. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Engage. Oh, look at the, the production budget on this. Nice! Look at them with the special end credits. That's fun. That one was a lot of fun. Peppered with so many sci-fi references, even just like terminating the game with Judgment Day. Terminator 2, Judgment Day. Uh, I, I, I love all this stuff, but I, I feel like I missed a couple because I'm sure there's some UK specific sci-fi that just hasn't made it across the pond or I'm unaware of. I, I got the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I got the Doctor Who, but but I feel like there might have been a few others in there that I just missed out on. If I did, by all means, let me know in the comments. You guys are great about doing that sort of thing. But yeah, no, I mean, this is right in my wheelhouse. Surprisingly little Star Wars, but I get it. This is more of a Star Trek leaning production team than a Star Wars production team. And I that's fine, you know, Nerds have to make a choice at some point in their lives about which one they're more a fan of. And I went through my Star Trek phase. I was absolutely a Trekkie back in my late teens and 20s. But, but I've come back around to the Star Wars world for numerous reasons. You should check out my Star Wars reactions, by the way. Um, and if you're not watching Andor in particular check out Andor. It's it's brilliant and it's unlike anything else ever done in the Star Wars universe. E even for you self-proclaimed adults out there. It's worth watching. I I love how nerdy some of the, the, the guests are. I love Susan in this episode because she's just like in her element. She's just getting off on being able to wear a Star Trek tunic and her buzzer is the Doctor Who theme, and she knows, like, I, I don't doubt that she believes in alien visitations, and like, ah, oh, I, I, I love when a, when a guest gets that enthusiastic about a topic. It, it, it's really the most exciting thing about watching this show, when someone's just in their element and loving it. And, yeah, really, I, I think one of the, the underrated things about this this show is they do a really good job of finding the right group of guests for the particular episode and i don't know exactly how that process works whether they go okay we we can get these people on this day let's tailor an episode around them or whether it's the other way around it's like okay we have to do a, a quests episode who are the biggest uh sci-fi nerds that we know that might be available or you know oh you know like sometimes it's clear it's like oh giles brandreth is going to be on this episode let's find as many giles brandreth facts about his family tree as we can or oh we're going to do uh, an, an episode that features heavily on um polar expeditions and hiking in the himalayas well we should probably bring in Brian Blessed, or, you know, this one's going to be about space. Let's bring in that astrophysicist guy. You know who I'm talking about. Nevertheless, I, I get why they sometimes do it that way, but but in episodes more like this, I'm, I'm just curious how they, how they match guests to episodes, because uh, sometimes it, it seems to be very fortuitous. Yeah, I, lo I love this one uh, very much my... 
my wheelhouse too. I'm I'm thinking back to cassettes in cars now because the one I grew up with was a mixtape that my mother's one of my mother's best friends made for her for her 30th or 35th birthday or something like that. And it was all these like classic songs from the the early early days of rock and roll like the late 50s early 60s and and i'm and we're talking about like 1980 to 85 that's the thing that played in the toyota corolla station wagon that i got driven to and from school and so yeah i think we've all got one of those the the joseph and the amazing technicolor dreamcoat soundtrack I never had the privilege of listening to so I'm completely unfamiliar with that and I'm blown away by how much of the audience on the other hand was fully on board kind of blows my mind but then I had never watched Grease until six months ago either so check out my reaction to that there are gaps in my cultural knowledge I will be the first to admit that Anyway, thank you guys so much for spending a little bit of time with me here today on Neil Talks. It's greatly appreciated. As always, I love hearing your comments about this episode. If there's any episodes you'd love to see me react to that I haven't reacted to yet, by all means, let me know as well in the comments. I have a list. I'm working my way through it. Eventually, I will get to yours, I promise. And uh, until next time, everybody, take care, stay healthy, and we'll see you soon. Cheers.